Alrighty. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm going to be talking to you about the OpenStack Ansible project update um, for, well, for this current, the Pike cycle, and then uh, what we're planning to do for the uh, Queens and Rocky cycle uh, moving forward. Um, so my name is Andy McRae. I'm the current PTL uh, for OpenStack Ansible, and I was the PTL for the Okada cycle as well. Um, so, so for the last two cycles, um, Alrighty, so uh, I mean, some, some of the key things, what does OpenStack Ansible do? Um, so we're all about production deployments of OpenStack using Ansible. Um, I guess it's in the name, so you probably figured that one out um, pretty quickly. Um, so we used to be called the OpenStack Ansible Deployments Project um, on Stackforge, um, but we moved to the OpenStack namespace um, a couple of cycles ago, um, and we're now just called OpenStack Ansible. Um, so the, the whole key, uh, and what we're after is just doing uh, production-ready deployments, so um, allowing you to, to scale um, and you know, um, customize your uh, infrastructure and your uh, OpenStack services around your hardware and, and your needs uh, for your use cases. So we don't enforce things. So for example, you can deploy services and containers, um, but you can put them on metal too if you want. Um, and uh, you, can, you can then decide what you want to do um, so it's flexible and customizable. And we really just want it to work uh, at scale in production. Um, and we want to do things like upgrades um, correctly um, so that we know they work and are tested, um, which, which we do have uh, testing for upgrades and, and various other things. Um, so a couple things uh, in, in the description there. We use uh, Alexi containers um, to build some of the OpenStack infrastructure services. Um, like I said, you don't need to do that, but uh, uh, by default, we'll, we'll set those up um, as part of the, the deployment itself. Um, we think that containers are a pretty good um, way to deploy your infrastructure services. Um, you get some really cool benefits around how you can do upgrades, uh, consistency, uh, repeated deployments, um, various other things. It's, it's just a, a really good way of doing that. Um, so a quick background, um, it started off as a POC in the Havana cycle. Um, I was working uh, on that at the time, and um, we then moved it to Stackforge uh, in the ISAL cycle, so literally the next cycle over. Um, and um, it moved from Stackforge to OpenStack uh, namespace in the Kilo cycle. So for those of you that aren't familiar, the Stackforge uh, project was kind of like uh, where you put all the OpenStack related projects that aren't specifically like Nova or Keystone or like specific OpenStack projects. So like deployment projects were all in Stackforge. Um, there were various like other kind of analytics and, and things like that there. Um, a lot of really useful stuff and, and a lot of that got moved into the OpenStack namespace um, when, uh, we, when we moved, uh, when, when they moved to the big tent model. Um, so I don't really like stats around like contributors and stuff, but um, according to Stack Analytics, we had 106 or something unique contributors. A lot of those are kind of, I guess, like drive by one contribution. So I don't want to like uh, paint this picture that we literally have like 100 people developing this thing. Um, that's not the case. But we do have um, a set of, uh, a, a pretty big set of people that have more than 10 contributions um, in terms of code commits. Um, and uh, we have, um, a set of at least 10 to 15 people that are consistently uh, doing like a larger number of, of contributions. So um, I think for every project that kind of how many contributors we have stat is a little bit misleading. <laughs> um, and I know there was a discussion about that for Stack Analytics. Um, I personally found it useful to know um, who's kind of interested, even if it's just for one commit. Um, it kind of gives you an idea of some people who are at least looking at it. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't like read too much into that personally. Um, cool, so Pike, um, what, what have we added or what are we adding? Because uh, it's not over yet. We've got a couple of months to go until September. Um, so we're a cycle trailing project, which means we get essentially a two weeks extra at the end of each um, kind of milestone and release period um, to, to finish up features. And the reason for that is as a deployment project, we utilize the kind of uh, head of master for the other projects. So if Nova, for example, hasn't released yet, it's very difficult for us to to ensure that everything's working. And if they add a feature on the last day of the cycle, it's, or a fix that's really critical, it's hard for us to then implement that fix on the same day. So we get two weeks at the end. Um, so our official release for Pike will, I think, is September the 11th to the 17th. Um, so this is, uh, these are the things that, that you can expect. Some of these are actually already there. Um, so the CentOS support, um, we've been working on this not just for Pike, but in Okada, and I think we started working on it in Newton. Um, and so 
uh, we've been slowly adding support for CentOS and we now are at a state where we gate against it a full build. Um, so we have daily deployments running. Um, we've got some timing issues that it takes a little bit longer than our Ubuntu deploy, so it doesn't run on every commit because it times out. Um, but we have a daily uh, gate that runs and it's uh, building successfully at the moment um, on master and on stable Okada branch. Um, and we're slowly adding in extra services um, that we have working on Ubuntu that aren't yet working on CentOS. And so I would say that it's now at a stage where if people are interested in, in you know, using uh, OpenStack Ansible with uh, CentOS, uh, CentOS 7, then now is a good time to, to start trying it out and seeing if it, if it works for you um, and, and helping us to, to move it to a point where we can happily say that, yes, now it's, uh, you know, ready. Um, and because I know it's always a, a question, um, we do have some people running CentOS 7 clouds on uh, open, using OpenStack Ansible. Um, uh, there's two that I know of off the top of my head. Um, so it, it is being used. Um, but yeah, it probably isn't as uh, stable as the Ubuntu install that we've been doing for you know, many cycles now. So um, any help getting it there is appreciated. Um, so the next one's a, an OpenStack community goal. So all the projects have um, this goal around uh, deploying API services using uh, mod whisky or uwhisky instead of eventlet, um, and then like fronting it with a web server. Um, so we've decided, or we're deciding to do it with Nginx and uwhisky apps. Um, we think that this gives us a lot of benefits around scale, so you can put Nginx wherever you want and then um, link in the uwhisky apps. Um, also, uh, around consistency, um, all the apps will then be deployed in the same way. Um, and uwhisky allows you some really cool things you can do to help upgrades um, and service restarts. Um, you can do very cool things with reloads um, and the way that we kind of handle um, service updates. So we think that's a really cool benefit. Um, to be honest, we were already going to do it even if it wasn't a community goal. Um, but the fact that it's a community goal really helps us because we rely on all the other projects to implement uh, like mod whisky or at least a whisky app instead of, um, you know, doing eventlet. Um, and so uh, the link there is a, a spec. Um, so we have, um, we have a spec up that's currently being worked through with a work in progress patch. Um, and then uh, lastly, we have put a lot of focus on documentation over the last couple cycles. So in the Newton cycle, we redid the deployment guide. Um, and in the Okada cycle, we started working on an operations guide for OpenStack Ansible. And uh, we've actually last week moved it from being draft to being a actual like not draft guide. Um, there's a little bit more work to do before uh, we release Pike, but uh, it's at a point where we think it's, it's got some useful information for people. Um, so what it isn't is it's not a guide that's supposed to tell you how to operate Nova or Cinder or any of the other projects. It's aimed at literally being a guide to tell you how to do things with OpenStack Ansible. So because of the structure of how we set it up, it's slightly different to just running services um, in, in you know, various locations. We use virtual environments, for example, so if you want to um, so if you want to be able to use the CLI, you need to go to what we call a utility container, or you need to um, activate your virtual environment for, say, Nova to get the Nova CLI. Um, and so there's that kind of information, also information around how the, the built-in database that we have runs. Um, you don't have to use that database, but I think a lot of people are, so we've got some operations information around that. Um, so for Pike, we've, uh, we've kind of been asked to like uh, put up how we see the focus on, on the various things um, uh, for the Pike release. So um, I'm, a lot of these basically link in with the three goals that were before. So for example, uh, the scalability and resilience and manageability, um, we think that the, the UWSGI um, U goal uh, addresses that. Um, we feel like we can, we can scale better, we can put Nginx in various locations, and uh, we can uh, you know, do restarts in a much more intelligent manner. Um, so, so that kind of speaks to the resiliency and the manageability and scalability ones. Um, user experience, the guide, and addition of uh, Sensor 7 support, like uh, I hope will help with user experience. It's, it's been a focus for us. Um, security is always a focus. Um, it, it, there hasn't been specific work going into it, although um, Major, Major Hayden has uh, added Sensor 7 support to his Stig uh, repo. Uh, so we've got the OpenStack Ansible security role, um, which kind of addresses some of the security um, standards. Um, so if you're interested in that, that isn't specific to OpenStack Ansible. Um, it runs against OpenStack Ansible, but you can run it against hosts if you want. So if, if you're interested in that, take a look. Um, and interoperability, well, we kind of always care about it. Um, 
because <laughs> we wanted to work with as many services as we can, but uh, it, there was not a specific focus. And then modularity, I always put as not a focus because the way we've designed it makes it really modular. So we don't need to focus on doing anything to make it more modular because of uh, the way it's designed anyway. Um, so in Queens, um, these slides seem backwards. Let me, here we go. So uh, possible features and enhancements for Queens. Um, so we're looking to uh, build artifacts, um, which would essentially be, um, work's already gone into that. We've uh, started to split the way we do deploy so that we tag based on uh, different phases of a deployment. So you have installation, configuration, um, and there's a third one that <laughs> I can't think of off the top of my head. Um, but essentially the idea is that uh, you can do different stages of a deploy using tags. Um, and the aim really is that you would then be able to deploy an artifact, so for example a container, um, and then do the configuration steps only by running a tag. So we don't have to change anything in um, the way we do our tasks and plays, um, but we can just use the tags to, to get the benefits of not having to deploy individual containers and instead uh, moving uh, artifacts into place. Um, so yeah, the separation of uh, deployment steps there. Um, so uh, we've put some work into doing uh, system D integration, which has added like some Isolation reporting and monitoring um, for the for the like services that you run, um, and I know uh, Kevin Cardinal is doing a, a lot of work in that space to to make it more kind of like reliable and um, and manageable for all the services. Um, and then there's been work to, that's already started to add Suzy support um, for OpenStack Ansible. Um, so I'm it's work that's going to be going on in Queens. I can't promise it'll be finished by then, but um, it's it's all things that are happening in that cycle. Um, so I'll just go back to the other side. Um, so these kind of link in with, again, the focuses. So the scalability and the resiliency is all around like um, the, the artifacting work and the system D work. Um, and so, um, and the interoperability and the user experience. We think that the SUSE work will, um, you know, add a, a better user experience for, for people who'd, who'd like to deploy um, not on CentOS or, or Ubuntu. Um, uh, so for Rocky, uh, if I'm honest, it, at this point, it's like we haven't had the PTG for, uh, for Queens yet, so it's quite hard to say what we'll be doing um, in Rocky. But I, I, we, we always have key focuses. I mean, all six, apart from modularity, which we, I would say we get as a built-in by the way we've designed it, um, they're all kind of like uh, focuses for us. Um, but I think that we're going to start using some of the like, benefits of doing artifacting um, to, to like, improve our upgrade process. And I think that adds resiliency so, um, and manageability. So I think those are the two of the key things that I would hope we will get out um, by the time we, we're moving to Rocky. Um, and user experience is always important to us. Um, I, think, I think we've put enough effort in to show that like, doing documentation and helping people um, utilize the, the kind of deployment system is a key focus for us. Um, and I definitely don't see that changing. Um, you know, a deployment project that no one uses is a pointless, <laughs> pointless deployment project. Um, so we were asked to come with a question um, for what uh, we would like uh, feedback for. Um, and, and I guess the, the question that I, I always like to ask is um, what is the biggest barrier to people uh, when trying to deploy their cloud using uh, OpenStack Ansible? Um, we'd love to try and make that easier um, if we can. I know there's some difficult things that, you know, as much as we'd love to make it easier, it's kind of about your uh, hardware or infrastructure. I think to, uh, some of the feedbacks always are oh, networking is hard to set up and, you know, like it's, it's hard to integrate those things. Um, we'd love to help document those things, but at the end of the day, like setting up networking and having knowledge to set up your infrastructure's networking is probably still going to lie on your shoulders. But, um, you know, if there's something we can do that to make this easier, um, uh, we'd like to do it. As, a, as an example, um, we've had a lot of feedback around the way we install our virtual environments and uh, PIP packages, and um, there's work going on. Um, at least last week, I saw some patches for it um, to move from using a kind of uh, Python script that's hard to read the output of um, to using Ansible tasks that are a lot more uh, like uh, modular, and, and it kind of shows you exactly where it failed rather than just a, a dump output. So um, we do take the feedback that people give us pretty seriously, and we try. Uh, Build, in, build it in so that it's, it's easier for people uh, to use. Um, and then if anyone has time, we'd love to get um, opinions on the operations guide. Um, it is very new, so there's going to be some stuff in there that's uh, not quite right. We're going to do a, a final kind of, uh, at the PCG we did a review phase. We got all the developers to take a section and just like wholesale cut out things that were just wrong or fix up things that, that needed fixing up. Um, 
and uh, there's more of that because a lot more content has gone in, in the, the last few weeks. So we'll be doing um, that again, but if anyone's interested or, or would like to tell us what we're missing from it, that would be cool too. Um, so yeah. Um, so they told us to keep it short so that we can take a long time for questions on these sessions. They were about 20 minutes. So I'm actually about five minutes fast. Um, but um, that's pretty much the update for, for OpenStack Ansible for these past couple of cycles. So if there are any questions, um, I'm happy to, to answer anything really related to, to OpenStack Ansible, um, what we've achieved in Akata as well and, and moving forward. So if there are any questions, my only ask would be if you could use the microphone. Um, otherwise, I can try to repeat the question. Um, but yeah. Yeah, <laughs> should put one closer back. <laughs> um, my question was I was always uh, intrigued in your project, but I was confused about the LXC container piece of it. Do yeah. you guys have any, any thoughts around kind of moving to Docker to be more in line with uh, um, what other people are doing? Or um, So when we started doing it, um, well, OK, so I think they're slightly different, like, uh, I guess, ideologies behind it. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, we get the question a lot, so it is kind of like, a, hey, you know, you do Docker and you can do like Kubernetes and stuff. But um, I, I, we actually investigated Docker early doors, um, and we didn't really like the way um, it handled certain aspects of it. Um, we also had like, um, we also run with like, so our LXC containers run as basically hosts. So you can actually connect to them and do commands on them and like operate them in a way that you would operate a normal host, but they're just lighter weight containers, right? And the, the Docker model doesn't do that. Um, and the other thing, uh, one of the other key reasons I would say that we didn't do that is because we, we kind of wanted the flexibility of, OSA itself uses LXC containers by default, but, and this kind of sounds weird, but we don't actually care what the, what the host is, right? We don't care if it's a container or a host, it's literally just a place to connect to and run some tasks. Um, whereas the Docker model is definitely more of a pre-create a thing and then move it into place, and then you are in a way like locked into whatever that thing is, right? So. In, in OpenStack Ansible, you can decide that, um, we've had some use cases where people ran Swift um, on physical hosts, the proxy services. So um, they were having a performance bottleneck and they needed more power and so they just ran the proxies on physical hosts. And then they then co-located memcache on those hosts. Um, so if you're in a Docker container model, you either need like a memcache container and a Swift proxy container and then like kind of connect them, which is fine, like that will work. Um, but you then, there's always an overhead with running a container anywhere, like regardless of how small that is. Um, and so we kind of just like the flexibility of being able to just point at a host and deploy some stuff. Um, the Alexi container bit is just our version of like, hey, let's just do containers because we think it's a really cool way to handle the infrastructure services. Um, so on that note, I would say that we uh, purposefully don't deploy uh, things like Cinder Volume if you're using LVM, uh, Nova Compute, uh, Swift storage services, we purposely deploy those on metal um, because uh, there's kind of like a one-to-one -one ratio between like the server and the service. So like you can't run two Nova computes on one physical compute host, right? Like it doesn't make sense you're managing the same resources underneath. And Swift storage, in fact, I would say is even worse because you want to keep, make sure that you have consistency of the storage on your host. Um, and like if you put it in containers, you now have to mount that storage and it just becomes a mess where you're like adding complexity for no real benefit in my opinion at least. Um, but all the infrastructure services like APIs and everything is awesome in containers. So um, yeah, it, it's a slightly different ideology. Um, I'm, I don't think we'd ever move to Docker um, personally. Kevin would probably kill me if I said we would. So um, yeah, I, I think we like the way we're doing it now um, and we're, we're really after like stability and upgrades and making sure that we have a consistent deploy rather than you know, constantly trying to chase um, a new technology that's a, a, an ever moving goalpost, I would say. Um, like, I imagine it's Kubernetes and Docker today and uh, something that hasn't come around yet tomorrow. And if you try to chase that, I think that your users suffer because you rip stuff out from under them. Um, and we really do not want to do that. We'd like you to be able to upgrade to whatever the Z release will be on OpenStack Ansible from here. So. So follow up on that. Um, so for, for people that feel like LXC uh, itself is too exotic, uh, how, how well tested is the a bare metal deployment of all services? Um, and so do you do gate on it or? Yeah, yeah. so actually um, we have a scenario test that's just gone in. So we don't gate on it. We have a periodical that runs daily. I think Kevin set it up. So. It's a daily test, so it runs once a day. So effectively, if code merged that broke the bare metal, we wouldn't notice it. 
um, but we would notice it when we check the dailies, which we're actually doing because um, we have full upgrades uh, in a periodical that runs daily as well, just because it takes like longer than the one hour, I think, one and a half hours we have for a, a gate, it takes longer than that to do a full deploy and then upgrade. So we do that on a daily and we check that and then we have our CentOS gate runs on a daily that we check as well. Um, and there's a couple, so we, we check those pretty regularly. So uh, I would say that by the end of a release, um, bare metal will work, but if you, if you get it, if you wanna use master branch and you're like halfway through a release, I'm not sure I would guarantee that it will work. Um, but that's not so much about us and it's more about like things changing in the other upstream projects um, that we, we deploy from master. So like in our master, we test the head of all the other projects um, just so that we, we know when they change stuff and it breaks our code and we fix it as quickly as possible. So there are definitely periods where things aren't working on master, but the stable branches are good, so. Thank you. No problem. Hi there. Uh, first of all, thank you for your talk. It was really nice. Um, yes. I do have a question. We are using OpenStack Ansible pretty successful in, cool. in the Newton release. Yeah. So it's uh, really nice and helpful to us. Uh, currently, we are working on a CI/CD implementation for that. Oh, cool. uh, do we have any experience, or is it uh, planned uh, to, um, to integrate CI/CD to, to OSI as well? Um, I don't know. Kevin, do you know anything about that you could speak to? I know, I mean, I know that various organizations using it do CI CD, <laughs> but I'm not sure what we would add in terms of integration for it. It's not something that I would say is a bad idea to have upstream, but I'm not sure what that would look like in terms of like different. So for example, I can say from, I work at Rackspace, so in our private cloud team, we have um, some integration testing between like OpenStack Ansible and like some monitoring stuff that is Rackspace specific that they've uh, put in there. Um, and I think some logging bits, um, but we're actually trying to move the logging stuff out of um, Rackspace specific and, and more upstream. But yeah, I, I'm not too sure what a generic CI um, pattern would look like, but I'm, I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure. Um, but um, if you have some ideas though, I'd love to hear them because um, that is something that like a lot of people want to do, right? Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, we'd be, we'd be, I'd be keen to see what your ideas are at least. So. Okay. Yeah, so. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. We, we have an OpenStack Ansible Ops uh, repository as well, which is uh, kind of where we put a bunch of tools that are not necessarily like uh, related to setting anything up, but I'm more just like, I think there's some for like adding compute hosts and removing compute hosts and doing kind of operational tasks uh, in like Ansible playbooks that will already link in with the OpenStack Ansible like inventory. Um, so that would be a really cool place to have uh, those kind of set up and play for like CICD. Um, and also the ops guide would, like Kevin said, that would be a really great place to, to put that kind of thing as well, I think. Um, I guess it doesn't have to be very specific. It could just be more generic around like, here's things you can do and here's how you wanna hook it in. I know that uh, Kevin and um, Major have been working on uh, monitoring plugins that are very generic um, that we plan to use, um, but the aim of them is to be more generic so they could be used by any deployment uh, project. Um, so yeah. Okay, thank cool. you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so Ke Kevin told me I come up, had to come up and troll you. Um, but actually I have some nice, th nice things to say. Uh, Kudos on the OpenStack Ansible security stuff. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, we have. Uh, major. Uh, yeah, it's major. <laughs> we have an adjacent project, so we don't use your deployer, but we started using the security, uh, the security, and it works perfectly. Yeah. Uh, and then the doc stuff is amazing, so kudos to the folks doing your doc stuff. Yeah, I will, I'll send that on. Yeah, uh, we did put a lot of effort into uh, the doc stuff, and well, getting the security stuff out was uh, effort. But yeah, thank you. I'll send that on. Yep. And then a quick question about the choice of Nginx over Apache, given that Apache is kind of the default that OpenStack uses. Yeah. Are you expecting any issues with like some of the Actually, weirder Keystone Federation and um, Okay, so yeah, that's, that's uh, interesting. So Keystone Federation, um, so one of the discussion points we're having is leaving Keystone if you want to federate in Apache because that path already works. Um, although some of the Keystone devs have already told us that getting it working in Nginx would not be uh, difficult and they literally just need to sit down for a bit and do it. So yeah, there are some concerns around that. Um, also, we actually ran into our first bug in Nova because we were using Nginx instead of Apache um, and they did some really weird things with like HTTP headers um, uh, that they assumed wouldn't be there or like, I don't know, there were some weird settings and it kind of threw a stack trace and died, but that's now fixed. Um, but essentially, um, I can't remember who it was, but one of our community members basically did some like 
uh, performance and was like, well, we can get better performance out of Nginx. So we had a discussion around it and went, well, if it's better, then let's just use it. And uh, you know, we, we gate on all this stuff and we, we hit master. So if we run into these bugs by the time we release it, it should be good to go. Um, and actually, we had uh, in Akata, if you deploy Akata, you'll have the Nova placement service, Nova API placement service. Um, that's new. That runs uh, behind Nginx and UWSGI. Um, so from Akata, we've had that. And actually, we've had Keystone support for Nginx and UWSGI um, for like three cycles now, maybe. Um, but you couldn't do federation with that. Um, so yeah, there is that concern. Thanks. Go. Again, this is my third open stack Ansible <laughs> session this week because I like Telat. Uh, I have another question which I forgotten to ask yesterday. Sure. We are trying to set up CI/CD using open stack Ansible, and we intend to use latest and greatest on master. Yeah. And I see you are bumping versions on a weekly basis. Sometimes it is like every second week or yeah, something it's on two master. Weeks, yeah. yeah. Do you have any plans to be more aggressive and automate that process so we get weekly instead of uh, weekly to weekly? Daily, um, kind of. I mean, uh, to be honest, I have no real preference about how often we do it. The only thing I would say is that uh, the release team uh, starts to struggle if we release too frequently, um, <laughs> because we were getting to a period where it was taking more than two weeks for the kind of just release patch in the releases repo to merge um, before we can actually do our, our SHA bump. So mm. the kind of process we do for releases is essentially um, we do the releases patch, which uh, goes into the OpenStack releases uh, repo. They then tag our like release, so like 15.1.2, uh, I think, is the latest uh, Akata one. Um, and, then, uh, and then we SHA bump all our like upstream uh, pointers to point to the head of uh, stable Akata for our roles and for the upstream uh, services. And then we kind of leave it for two weeks to make sure there's no like major issues. And then we release again. Um, but we were running into issues where like the releases patch, which we depend on to merge before we can do our SHA bump, was taking uh, like more than two weeks to merge. But is it the same with master? Do you do any release work on master? Uh, no, so on master, uh, on master we do do, uh, we follow the kind of milestones um, mm. for OpenStack. So we'll have like milestone one and then two and three. Um, and then like, I think it's like RCs. So, uh, but pretty much we just do like one RC and then, and then push it out. So uh, now there should be a milestone one for uh, six, so it'll be 16.0.0.b1 or something like that. Um, and that's the like milestone one release for master. But if I'm honest, if you if you're trying things out on master, just use head of master or like um, you know maybe a, a SHA back or something like that. But mm. there's we don't pin um, we pin the upstream project SHAs in master, but not the role okay. SHAs. So you will always point to the head of master for each role in OpenStack Ansible. Whereas on the stable branches, we point to a specific SHA on those uh, upstream on the roles, the OpenStack Ansible roles. So okay. that's slightly different. Yeah. So well, then we can implement our own jobs to chase master all the time and lock them for our users. Yeah, yeah so on master, there are their owner releases. Um, well, I mean, those milestone releases, but they like once every uh, couple of months, I think. Okay. Um, so the next one is June. Um, so next month is, is milestone two. Um, so yeah. An additional question about the uh, daily jobs you mentioned. Are they uh, public? Are they running on uh, public yeah. Jenkins or? Yeah, yeah. They, um, they're uh, so. Um, the, the kind of um, CI, the OpenStack CI, allows you to do periodicals. Mm. Um, and so there's a, in the same way as you can go to like uh, the zool.openstack.org and see the like currently running jobs, um, there's like a periodicals you can go to and it'll show you the periodic periodicals that run. Okay. Um, so yeah, you can actually, you can see those and you can see the logs of why it failed in the same way as any other job. It okay. just runs at a, on a schedule and it doesn't have a timeout the way the others do. Mm. So it's, it's really good for our kind of upgrade tests and, and some other things. Okay. Thanks. Cool. Hello, and thank you for the presentation once again. Hey. This is more of a generic open sequenceable question. Sure. How much trouble would I have trying to deploy multi region installation using open sequenceable? Would I need to deploy the separate clouds and then work to manually merge them or? Can I do it somehow automatically? Um, so we did have a multi-region deploy. Um, so the OSIC, uh, the OSIC cloud, which was used for gating, had uh, multiple mm -hmm. regions in it. Um, so Kevin, I don't know if you want to talk about the multi-region work you did or how hard it was. Oh, yeah. Um, actually, I, I can share do you want to come up to the mic just so we can yank? That would be useful. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's called payback. <laughs> 
no, but, uh, uh, so multi-region stuff. I, I have some configs I'd be happy to share with you. Uh, effectively, it was two separate deployments uh, with infinite inventories that would hook back to one another so that we had uh, one Swift deploy, one Keystone, a uh, Keystone that oversaw everybody, and then different services for everything across the board. And I had a Compute Cloud and an Ironic deployment that was independent one of one another. Okay. Um, and we had uh, 250 Ironic nodes and 352 Nova Compute nodes working together inside of a multi-region cloud. Uh, and yeah, uh, all of it's public and happy to share all of that with you. Uh, our switch configs, uh, whatever you need. Yeah, that's all. It's all public. Yeah. It's all open, open domain. So, okay. Uh, but anyways, uh, it totally works. But you, the uh, the ugly bit is that they are independent deployments. They don't have a succinct inventory across the two. So you have deployment one, which is region one, mm -hmm. deployment two, which is region two. They okay. just have some shared variables. And th the keystone is shared between them, right? Yes. So it's not federated identity. It's fake federated Although identity. Although we. Yeah, um, because it is a it's one top level, what one top level identity provider. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, we do have some support for like federated auth and Keystone um, uh, that hasn't been like it, it's been there since Newton, I think. Um, or that, maybe that actually, that. and that totally works. Yeah, um, the federated our federated identity totally works. It's the uh, CLI interaction that's a that, pain. Uh, yeah, become a, a pain getting a federated token and then having to know that you need to set that every time you want to run a command. Um, like, oh, I'm running here, I'm running there. Another actually really ugly part with multi-region cloud is that it looks at region one, and then it looks at region two. Well, I added region two second. So if you don't specify the region in your command line call, it just always takes the last region. Um, so uh, like, you don't necessarily always want to be running uh, some command against your client. And if you take the RC file from Horizon, it doesn't have region in there. And so it's always running against region two. And so a lot of our users were like, uh, why is this not working? Why am I uploading my images to region two? Why can't I see it in region one? And uh, it was because they weren't setting region one. So there's some ugly parts there, but I have a huge write up on all of it. So I'm happy to done, share. I'll yeah. ask you yeah. for a link. Yeah, yeah. Well, you should have uh, done a Swift multi region deploy, and then you could have put the images yeah. in both sides. Yeah, boom. boom. See? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, We've still got eight minutes, so if there are any more questions, um, feel free to ask. And if, uh, if, you don't, if you remember something later and you want to uh, come talk to, to me or any of the, the OpenStack Ansible team, you know, feel free to reach out to us on IRC, uh, hashtag OpenStack Ansible on Freenode. And um, yeah, or Twitter or email, whatever. Um, and if anyone would like an OpenStack Ansible uh, Buffalo sticker, uh, feel free to, uh, to come up afterwards. Um, yeah, I've got a whole bunch, so you're welcome to them. <laughs> Cool. All right. Thanks, everybody.